Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 32 of ADHD for Spartass Women. This week's topic is about the basics of cognitive behavioral therapy. You'll hear me call it CBT. What is it? Who is it for? And how does it work with ADHD? Look, I have been learning everything I can about ADHD for almost five years. But I have to tell you that although I've had a general sense of what cognitive behavioral therapy is, turns out I didn't really know what it was. I just, I wasn't sure. Now, surprisingly, most members in our Facebook group have tried medication, but few members have tried CBT. But the few that have tried it are pretty darn positive about it. I want to let you know what some of them have said. So Diana offered, it has definitely helped. I'm in no way fixed, nor will I ever be or want to be, but it's helping me deal with RSD rejection-sensitive dysphoria, and realizing that my ADHD doesn't make me broken, just different. By the way, we have a whole podcast on RSD. It was one of our most popular episodes. Silja, I hope I pronounce, I'm pronouncing her name correctly, said, I benefited greatly from CBT, and I liked the homework part as it forced me to actively take what the therapist said into consideration in my everyday life. Lauren said, When I was first diagnosed, I thought it was really helpful, and I appreciated that it was time-limited and process-oriented, as I am not someone who wants to endlessly talk about stuff. I had done conventional talk therapy before and found it somewhat circuitous, and for lack of a better word, masturbatory. Is that a word? Masturbatory? Anyway. (laughs) Karen said, I have had cognitive behavioral therapy. I prefer it over traditional therapy. I highly recommend it. If I could find a therapist that understands my ADHD, depression, anxiety, and OCD, it would be great. I have worked as a manager in an outpatient mental health office for 10 years. Several years before that, I worked in a mental health facility for three years. I have a difficult time finding a therapist because my standards are high. Most of the therapists in my office use CBT, and a lot of their patients do well and actually like CBT instead of traditional counseling and say they finally feel like therapy is helping them. Sometimes they have already seen a few therapists before they get to us and have moved on because it wasn't a good fit for them. One therapist at our office sees teens through adults with ADHD and those on the spectrum. He's had great success, especially with those on the spectrum. I'm amazed at the difference from when they come for that first visit and when their therapy is completed to the point the patient feels they are ready to stop. This therapist has ADHD himself and gets great feedback from his ADHD patients that have CBT. Sarah volunteered, it was my therapist who practiced CBT that actually first diagnosed me with ADHD and helped get the ball rolling with that. I also carry a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. I'm not sure if the CBT is helping with the ADHD portion of my life, but it is sure helping my depression. I really feel like my life is improving because of CBT. Now, I do want to comment that there were one or two um, women that spoke up and they said they tried it and, you know, they weren't very successful with it. Like anything, it really starts with an attitude of wanting to do better 
This isn't talk therapy. You actually have to buy in and believe that this direction you're going in will actually help. And you have to be willing to change your thoughts and behaviors. So I don't really know why these two women, you know, felt that it, it wasn't helpful to them, but, but I wanted to mention that as well. So it's not a hundred percent, you know, of, of women in our group have said, oh my gosh, it's the best thing. So anyway, just a reminder that just because medication doesn't work for me, it doesn't mean that I'm against medication. I have seen that it can be life-changing. I just feel like it's not enough. You know, you've heard the phrase, pills don't teach skills. Well, medication helps you to focus, but you then need to make certain that you're focusing on the right things, right? Just because you're on hyper-focus doesn't mean it's all good. You could be hyper-focusing on, oh, I don't know, binge-watching a Netflix series or Instagram or video games. And although all of those things are fine in small doses, days on end of these things, that's just not going to be in your best interest. Now, once I started to understand what CBT actually is, I realized that it was right up my alley because number one, it's much more about action than talking. Number two, it starts with changing our thoughts, what we're thinking. Now, we know that we have 60,000 thoughts a day, at least. We don't even know when we're thinking or what we're thinking. It's, it's automatic. I also really liked it because it works with controlling our emotions and or feelings. And we know that our feelings create our actions and our actions create our results. So I'm not even sure if I should volunteer this, but I don't know. I'm going to go for it. I'm a huge Abraham Hicks fan. And when I first found out about Abraham Hicks, I mean, I got to tell you, the whole thing is weird. It involves channeling. It involves a word that I hate called manifesting. I am so not about the woo-woo. I am very practical. But what I realized with Abraham Hicks, and, and you can Google Abraham Hicks, she has a series of YouTube videos and she goes around the country and she basically, you know, people ask her questions and she responds. And I'm telling you, if I could have any woman's brain on the face of this earth, that is the woman's brain that I would choose. It's Esther Hicks and she's channeling Abraham. But what she says is so non-woo to me and so practical. And I have never heard her not be able to answer a question where you just weren't bowled over by her response. So I just want you to know it's really common sense. And the whole idea behind it is your thoughts control your feelings. Your feelings control your actions, what you do, and what you do controls, obviously your actions control your results. So I'll go into it a little bit more in a second. But I did want to mention that because, because I am such a, an Abraham Hicks fan, when I saw that CBT really involved looking at what you're thinking every day and work towards changing what you're thinking, it just made a lot of sense to me. Okay, so before I go off the rails here, what I also realized is that I was using CBT practices without knowing it on myself. And I found them to be highly successful because I can't use meds. What I did instead was I found CBT like strategies, not knowing that's what they were. And I started to employ them and I found them highly useful. Okay. So the minute I started to dive into what is CBT, I, you know, immediately I wanted to know more. Okay. So what is CBT? I'm still sort of stumbling over the fact that I admitted that Abraham Hicks thing, but I'm telling you, go look her up. You got to listen to her though, for I listen to her when I work out. You got to listen to her for about a week and all of a sudden it's going to make sense. At first you're going to think she's a nut. Okay. So what is CBT? According to Russell Ramsey, who's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania, where he specializes in CBT and adult ADHD. He's written a number of books on the subject. CBT is a form of psychotherapy that emphasizes the interplay between cognition, so what are we thinking, behaviors, what do we do, and emotions. CBT for ADHD, it's actually fairly new. It's short-term, it's goal-oriented. I love the fact that it's short-term and goal-oriented because it just works well with my you know, more action-oriented brain. What we're trying to do in CBT is to change the negative patterns of thinking. It's basically brain wiring or brain training for brain rewiring or brain training for ADHD. Remember neuroplasticity, right? We can actually change our brains. 
With CBT, you're not treating ADHD. What you're doing is you're trying to lessen how it impairs your life. Whether you're talking about procrastination, time management, disorganization, you're identifying how and when it impairs your life how and when you struggle with it. So for example, do you struggle with paying bills on time? Do you struggle with being late? Do you struggle with keeping your commitments? With CBT, you're also learning about your ADHD and why your brain is the way it is. You're learning that you're not defective, that you know your brain and the way you think is not because there's a moral failing on your part or a character flaw. Most of us with ADHD know what we need to do. We just struggle to actually do it and get it done. CBT focuses on building work rounds to make that happen, on managing negative expectations and emotions, because although emotion is not part of the DSM, we know all experts agree, all ADHD experts agree that it is a huge part of ADHD. CBT also focuses on discovering What negative behaviors you've adopted actually interfere with your ability to live to your potential and to, you know, get done what it is that you want to get done. CBT is centered around challenges the patient is experiencing in their daily life. So what are they struggling with today? And it can look different in terms of the therapy. So CBT can look different for each patient because it's set up to your individual needs, whatever it is that you need to work on, that you want to work on. So CBT was actually introduced 50 years ago, and it was originally a treatment for anxiety, depression, PTSD, so mood disorders. Before CBT, there was this belief that you could only deal with problems by going into the past. But then CBT came onto the horizon, and the idea was that our thoughts are actually what cause our emotional difficulties. And I completely agree with this. So what you're saying to yourself can really affect your life. What jobs you'll go for, what relationships you'll be in, what risks you're willing to take. And I'm going to go into that in a little, you know, a little bit more in a few sec, in a few minutes. But let me say that we know that our thoughts don't cause ADHD, that it's primarily genetic. But our thoughts can absolutely cause anxiety and depression, which is why anxiety, if if we look what underlies anxiety and depression, we will often discover that it's ADHD. That said, you can imagine the experience of growing up with ADHD, especially undiagnosed ADHD, not doing well in school, struggling with relationships, constantly being told you're lazy, unmotivated, or even stupid. I mean, it makes sense that this would really impact how you think, what you think about yourself, how you cope, your attitudes and your beliefs, right? And remember that ADHD experts estimate that by the age of 12, kids with ADHD receive 20,000 more negative messages from parents, teachers, and friends than kids without ADHD. There is definitely a direct link between negative thoughts and ADHD. And I have to tell you, I see that in our group every day. Now, not everybody struggles with it, but a lot of those of us with ADHD do. Now, what else? Well, the lens that we see the world through, it definitely affects who we become. You know, you ask yourself, do I have grit and persistence? Am I able to do things because I know they're going to move forward what I want in my life? Am I able to move those things forward? Am I able to see options? Am I able to see a setback as situational and short term? And maybe even as a learning opportunity. Or have I adopted learned helplessness where I just give up? I don't even try. I think, oh my gosh, nothing I do will ever work out. It's me. It's my fault. And Remember, we had a whole podcast on learned helplessness and how many women with ADHD actually live with learned helplessness as well. What else? Well, do we assume the best case scenario or do we assume the worst case scenario? And I'm going to tell you something embarrassing now. Probably twice a year, I buy a lottery ticket. I don't know why I do it. 
but I think it's just to amuse myself. And I have to tell you, every single time I scrape off the numbers, you know, of the lottery ticket, I am absolutely shocked that I did not win. And I know this probably sounds completely delusional, but I honestly believe that my attitude about things like that, you know, spreads to everything. This, you know, eternal optimism, like, what do you mean I didn't win? Of course I won. I, there must be some mistake, you know, and I'll go back and I'll check the numbers. And usually I don't even get one of the numbers right. But to this day, I st- always have this sense that, of course, I'm going to win. If anybody's going to win, it's me. And I really believe that that attitude is what has served me well and why I struggle so much less with the emotional dysregulation than a lot of women with ADHD have. Okay, what else? Self-esteem and self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is confidence in yourself that you can set out to do what you want to do. And both self-esteem and self-efficacy are so important if we are to be successful with our ADHD. You know, we know that the ADHD brain can be pessimistic and self-critical. And of course, you can understand why. We often blame ourselves for things that aren't even our fault. And we just naturally see the worst case scenarios. We have that prehistoric danger brain, the imposter syndrome, you know, at work or at school. I definitely did struggle with that. Oh my gosh, when they figure out that I have no working memory, I didn't call it at that time, but that I can't remember anything, I am going to get fired. You know, I shouldn't be in this class. I shouldn't have this job. Wait until they find out that I'm an imposter. You know, we can also not be as excited about the future because we assume that tomorrow is going to be just as bad as today and we're going to be struggling just as much. Attitude, however, is really important to staying engaged and staying motivated. Remember that positive emotion. I mean, how important it is to our ADHD brain. If we don't have positive emotion, we cannot feel motivation to continue. When you think about procrastination, I mean, think about it. It's really, it's disengagement. You know, we don't want to do something. We don't have positive emotion around it. Actually, we have very negative emotions, so we disengage, so we don't have to do it. There's also mistrust. Now, when you're abused, it's mistrust of others. When you have ADHD, what you're talking about is not being able to trust yourself. So let's go back to what CBT focuses on. Okay, number one, cognition. What are we thinking? Number two, behaviors. What are we doing? Number three, emotions. And number four, building skills to accomplish what we want to accomplish. So if I start with cognition, I'm going to go back to a little bit of the hippy dippy stuff. We we start with cognition. We're talking about what are we thinking? And remember, your thoughts create your feelings and emotions. Your feelings create your actions, what you're actually going to do. And your actions create your results, like what's going to happen, right? how, you know, how your life is impacted. Now, everything starts with your thoughts, right? Let's say I haven't heard from a friend in a month. And I think back to when I last saw her and I suddenly remember that maybe something not entirely appropriate flew out of my mouth. And at the time I was talking to her, I thought, hmm, maybe this could be misdrewed. Maybe she's upset about it. But then things seemed okay. So I forgot about it. But now I haven't heard from her in a month. So I start thinking and thinking and thinking, you know how we do that, right? And every day that goes by, I convince myself that it must have been what I said. And I start to feel really crappy and bad and kind of anxious about it. So my thoughts are the only thing that have now created this bad feeling. And instead of just calling my friend and asking her and checking in, I decide to call all of our mutual friends instead or I do absolutely nothing. So this is my action or my inaction. Now, because of that action or inaction, I could end up where we never talk again because my friend really was upset. Or all this thinking and not feeling good leads me to pick up the phone where I talk to my friend and I discover that her and her entire family have been really sick. So now I see that the best case scenario is I've now put myself through at least a week of all this negative thought and feeling terrible for nothing, right? Or the worst case scenario is she really was upset at me and we're no longer friends because I refuse to act in a way that is better for me and her. 
So I hope that makes you see how important our thoughts are and our thoughts, everything that happens in our life starts with our thoughts. Our thoughts create this feeling in our body, emotion, right? And this feeling in our body, this emotion creates what we're going to do or not do. So our actions, and then our actions create what our results are, what we end up having and not having in our life. Now, we know that our ADHD makes us so creative and vividly imaginative, right? But it also gives us this ability to hyper-focus, kind of like what I was doing in that scenario just now. And we know that bad is always bigger than good. It's just stickier. I think I read a statistic that our brain remembers negative thoughts more readily than positive thoughts, right? So we need five positive thoughts to counter one negative thought. And I think that's for your neurotypical brain. I don't even think that's for the ADHD brain. It's probably many more positive thoughts. You know, we need many more positive thoughts to counter that one negative thought. So we start hyper-focusing on negative stuff. We disastertize, we catastrophize. Inattentives especially, we have this hyperactivity of the mind, right? And we start ruminating. And we develop this style of thinking where we're like a hamster on a hamster wheel. We're running and running and running, but we're getting nowhere. So we start obsessing about a past problem. Oh my gosh, my friend has not called me in a month. We obsess about a loss, any kind of setback. But you just keep thinking about these things and you never move forward and take action. You do absolutely nothing except think, think, think. So guess what? Nothing changes. Your problem remains unsolved. And so you end up feeling worse. You're thinking, thinking, thinking. And the truth is that our thoughts are what are responsible for our emotions. So if we're thinking bad thoughts, we're going to feel bad emotions. We need to learn how to think different thoughts if we want to experience different emotions. All this thinking, all these thoughts, they just kill us. And most of the time, they're not true. You've probably heard that quote, don't believe everything you think. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you had that negative thought a million times. It is not going to affect you now unless you think it again. You don't have to undo all those thoughts you had, or you just have to break the pattern of the thought now. So CBT looks for where your thoughts are distorted, and it has you question them. Distorted thoughts can be all or nothing thinking. It can be overgeneralizing. It can be mind reading. And I know for those of us with the interpersonal intuition, I am so sure I can read everybody's mind. But guess what? Sometimes I'm not right. We tend to exaggerate the significance of minor problems, but we can also trivialize our accomplishments. Or we magnify how uncomfortable it's going to be to start and how long it's going to take, as well as minimizing the amount of time it will take to get something done. This is my son. It takes him, you know, he'll say, ah, that homework thing, I can do that in 20 minutes. And really, it's like three hours. So we're on both ends of the spectrum. We can be totally pessimistic, but we can also be these eternal optimists. Now, let's say that the thought that you always have is that I'm always late. That is the automatic thought that always comes up. You kind of ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Well, it means I'm unreliable. What else does it mean? Well, it means I don't care about other people. With CBT, the first thing you would do was question if that's really true using logic. You would learn how to pause and identify the negative thoughts, and then you would question the thoughts, and then you would learn how to replace your distorted thoughts with realistic thoughts. CBT has you look at new belief systems by educating yourself on why you might always be late. Maybe it is true. But in order to make any changes in your life, first you have to understand how you think and why you might think the way you do. Because when we understand our ADHD brains better, we are just going to be kinder to ourselves. Once you do that, then what you're going to do is you're going to work out a new coping strategy. You're going to problem solve. If it is true that you're always late and you have decided today that you don't want to be late any longer, what time management strategies could you employ that would help you to not be late anymore? You'd reverse engineer it. You maybe would backward plan it. 
Maybe you chunk it down into small steps. For me, I'm time blind. Two hours can literally feel like 15 minutes. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> my husband will say, okay, we need to leave in 15 minutes. I'm going to go out in the car and I'll be waiting for you. Actually, he usually says, we have to leave in five minutes. I'll be out of the car, you know, waiting for you. And I just start working on, you know, I'm working on something and I tell him, okay, I'll be there in five minutes. And I start working and all of a sudden I look up at the clock and 15 minutes has gone by and it literally felt like a minute. So what I have done, not knowing this was probably a CBT strategy, is I started putting clocks everywhere in my house, even in the shower, because the shower was the worst part. Like I could literally go in the shower for 45 minutes and think it was five minutes. I don't know what it is about the warm water. I have my best thoughts in the shower. It's so comfortable. You don't want to leave, especially when it's cold outside, right? So clocks everywhere. The shower on my makeup mirror in my car. I had an Apple watch on my wrist. Reminders that buzz me an hour before I have to leave, then 30 minutes, then 15 minutes. And then now you got to leave now. And it sounds silly, but every time I'm no longer late, I've mastered this time thing a bit, a bit better. And it really makes you feel so good. It definitely affects my emotions. It creates that positive emotion. And I'm proud of myself. And I've said so many times that there is no better feeling than feeling like you're proud of yourself. It really bothers me when people say, I'm proud of you. I mean, other than my mother, you know, like, who are you to be proud of me? What's important to me is that I'm proud of myself. And when I'm proud of myself, I then want to do more of what it was that I was doing that made me proud of myself. And it becomes sort of a game. My positive emotions definitely affect my motivation to continue. And I would suspect that it's the same for you if you would just try it. So finally, with CBT, you want goals. But you don't want just any old goals. They need to be SMART goals that are specific. You've heard of SMART goals, right? Goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. In CBT, what you're also going to learn, you're going to learn how to use specific strategies for managing your ADHD, getting to work on time, starting a project you don't want to do, sticking to your plan, or building better relationships. And those are strategies like breaking down tasks into smaller pieces. If you can't start, that's a cue that you need to break down that task. I learned that. I'm not sure from who, but it's a CBT strategy. And I have noticed it really works for me. One of the things that I do is when I can't start, I pull out my Datex Cube or my Focus Keeper app, which uses the Pomodoro method. And all I tell myself is, all you have to do is commit to 25 minutes. If you want to stop after 25 minutes, then you can stop. You know, I have never stopped after 25 minutes because my problem is starting. My problem is not continuing. So what are some other strategies? Well, prioritization. We suck at this, which is why we're always putting out fires. If we have to do something and we're not interested in doing it, it's all equally unimportant to us. CBT teaches us how to prioritize and focus on the non-urgent important tasks. If we're only focusing on urgent tasks, again, that's when we're always putting out fires. Our goal is that tasks never get to that urgent stage. We also learn how to self-regulate, to do those things that we'd rather not do right then and there. We build strategies around them. Maybe it's a mantra that you tell yourself, but I think what it is, first and foremost, is an awareness that this is what we're doing to self-sabotage. What else? We mentioned time management as far as a strategy. I just talked about that as far as me getting out of the house in time. Another strategy that we can learn is to manage our emotions around tasks we don't want to do. What was so surprising to me is that I learned that if I would just start, I would feel so much better once I started than when I was thinking about starting but couldn't start. And so now I know that the minute I start, the dopamine kicks up in my brain because I'm proud of myself for even starting. So I am able to bypass all that negative emotion around starting and just start. We can also learn strategies around managing our behaviors. So for example, if you really want to work out and you can't seem to get to the gym 
because you go home, you sit on the couch and you can't get yourself up to get dressed and go to the gym. Don't go home. Bring your gym back to work and go directly from work to the gym. And only after you've gone to the gym, can you then go home? What you're doing or learning how to do is plan ahead. And you're using behavior to head off emotion so that you can stay on task and stay engaged. You know, the emotion is going to kick up once you're sitting on your couch at home and you are really not going to want to go. So instead, head off the emotion by requiring certain behavior like, I'm not going home until I go to the gym. You can also develop strategies to acknowledge this feeling of discomfort, kind of what I was talking about if you would just start, right? And what you can do, which is, you know, the workaround that I developed is you can still, you can say, okay, I am acknowledging that I hate this feeling. I feel totally uncomfortable. I don't want to start, but you know what I can do? I can still commit to 25 minutes. And again, if I don't want to do it, I don't have to do it. And like me, once you start, you probably won't want to stop. So you can learn how to be in that uncomfortable emotion for just a little bit. You don't have to always escape the emotion. The problem with procrastination is it's so insidious because when we do it, we get immediately immediate relief, which reinforces the procrastination. Russell Ramsey is the one who said this, and it was just like it just hit home to me that when we're procrastinating, we're usually not doing something fun. No, we usually see some chore in the house or on our desk that needs to be done, which is usually physical or manual, like throwing the dishes in the dishwasher, you know, taking care of the laundry, mowing the lawn, cleaning and organizing our desk. So we find these things that are more physical, that are more manual, and there's more of a cause and effect to doing those kinds of chores. We can see the results immediately, which gives us that little hit of dopamine. Now, writing a paper doesn't do that right away. The thing is, though, once you realize you do this and you start to understand that it's preventing you from getting done what you really need to get done to move your life forward, that is the first step. You need to build action into your day over intention. And so with CBT, you learn to develop these strategies that force you to act rather than intending to act, but actually doing nothing. So how does CBT compare to medication? There are no direct head-to-head comparisons yet, but clinical research or clinical experience shows that they do two different things. So medication reduces distractibility, it prolongs attention, it improves impulse control, versus cognitive behavioral therapy helps with your executive functions, with managing time, learning how to organize, learning how to plan. Medicine can help you focus, but it does not tell you what to focus on. Research also suggests that CBT works better for ADHD than other forms of therapy, and a 2010 study by Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital found that medication and CBT was more effective at controlling ADHD symptoms than medication alone. What else? You only want to hire a cognitive behavioral therapist who specializes in ADHD. They really have to understand what ADHD is and how it presents. Mary Salanto, she's another expert in ADHD, and I've gotten some of my information from her. I think she has an outstanding program. So she's an expert in ADHD and CBT. She also teaches at Hofstra and Yale. She's written several books, excellent books on the subject. I will post them in the show notes. And I saw some of the comments that her members posted about her small group program, and they felt it was very successful. And it was successful because the group, also helps to motivate, you know, you to change. So, you know, I think groups help with everything. If everybody else is struggling with the same thing, there's something about the safety of knowing that, number one, you're not the only one who struggles with it and really bouncing ideas back and forth and motivating each other to uh, to change. So anyway, the more I learn about CBT, the more I'm convinced of how important this is for those of us with ADHD, especially those of us that are inattentive and in our heads all the time. I also think that for us hyperactive types, the focus on action really makes sense. I know personally that action increases the dopamine in my brain, 
spikes my positive emotion and it makes me feel good. Now, I'm a strange bird in that I feel that I have lived with three different brains, an almost neurotypical brain that functioned quite well. That was number one. Number two, it was a pregnancy brain where I perpetually impressed even myself. Never in my life have I gotten so much done. I was on it. I had focused like I've never had in my life. I had a working memory. It was crazy, especially since so many of my friends were commenting that they had pregnancy brain, which meant that they they just couldn't function at all. And then number three, beginning in my 40s, I believe that's when I got my ADHD brain that I didn't recognize at all and I could not trust. And I've had people get upset at that comment, you know, that, wait a minute, you don't develop ADHD in your 40s. You have to have it as a child. Look, I have had the ADHD traits from childhood. Hyperactivity, I'm overly chatty. I'm hyper-focused to like scary on things I love. My parents called me the Burlingame Blab because I spilled all the family secrets, although I'm not even sure what I said. I mean, we didn't really have family secrets that I knew of. I had difficulty with transitions since the time I was a kid. I had report cards with very good grades, but they always mentioned how I could do even better if I wasn't so distracted, if I talked less, if I paid more attention, and if I distracted others less, like every report card. I definitely, I was all over the place. I had so much energy, but I was smart. And the other thing I noticed is I definitely have struggled with working memory since about the age of 12. And I've always wondered, how is it that I could have been the lead in a German play? Meaning the, you know, all my lines were in German. I could be the lead in a German play at 11, but I couldn't memorize one line of any song that I heard after the age of 12. I always wondered about that. And the thing about the ADHD diagnosis is that it's all about impairment. I don't believe that I would have qualified for the ADHD diagnosis as a child because I did well in school and I didn't have problems with relationships. I was a blurter, but I I just feel like I didn't struggle enough. It wasn't until my estrogen levels started to bounce around because there's a definite correlation between estrogen and dopamine. They're linked. That's when I really started to struggle. And a couple of months ago, I heard Edward Hallowell talk about late onset ADHD in women. So I know that I am not the only one. I know there is something there where, you know, you're smart, you have enough of a focus to get through school, and you're not really impaired until your dopamine levels plummet and, excuse me, your estrogen levels plummet. And then your dopamine is non-existent and all of a sudden you are severely impaired by your ADHD symptoms. So after researching CBT, I am completely convinced that without knowing it, I have built CBT-like strategies around myself for the last couple of years. I think that these structures were easier for me to build because I didn't struggle with the emotional dysregulation piece because again, I didn't get all the negative messages as a child. And so my ADHD symptoms as a child didn't rise to the level of impairment to qualify as ADHD. Today they have, but I'm slowly and surely building strategies that work for me. And now I'm really interested in CBT and I want to learn as much as I can because what I have come to discover about myself is I crave action. That is the way I've learned to get myself out of every hole. That is the way I have learned to address every fear that I now have, you know, that's because of my ADHD brain. So anyway, what I'm going to do is next week, I'm going to continue this focus on CBT with my guest, Diane Winger. She is an expert in CBD and CBT and ADHD. And I will tell you right now, she believes that you can change your self-concept with, C- she calls it CBC, Cognitive Behavioral Coaching. Diane was a therapist for many years. She got her master's at UCLA. She was on the faculty of Children's Hospital LA. She believes that therapy can take you from terrible to tolerable and even from tolerable to good. But if you want to be great, CBC, Cognitive Behavioral Coaching, is the answer. Now, you can't go to Cognitive Behavioral Coaching right away if there's been trauma, abuse, or serious loss. You need to heal that first with therapy. You need to work through that. But You can do both at the same time. You know, if you're constantly asking, what is wrong with me? Guess what? Your brain is compelled to find an answer and it's going to look for every stupid thing you've ever done. I promise you. So according to Diane, what we need to learn how to do is give our brains better 
questions. Instead of asking what is wrong with me when you do something that's not great, how about asking how can I make this work for me? We just have to ask better questions. So I hope you'll join me and Diane Winger next week. As always, you are listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. You've been listening to me for a while. I would really appreciate a review. It is not hard to do, and it makes such a difference. If you're on the iTunes platform, just scroll down to the bottom. You can click on the stars. You can write something. I would so appreciate it. That's all you have to do. If you'd like to know more about me, our patent pending cartography system that teaches you how to figure out which of the many interests that you have is the one that you should pursue, or if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com, click on podcast in the navigation bar. You're going to see a microphone to your right where you can leave me an audio message. You can also reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.